requirements for bacterial growth and one of those factors of course is temperature so let's just kind of do like we always do and arrange this in order of low to high so at the lowest temperatures we have the psychophiles you know if somebody is a psycho psychotic they're a cold-blooded killer yes that's super cheesy but it helps me remember things so psychophiles have uh, these are bacteria that have the optimum growth, not the necessarily um, optimum, you know, enzymatic activities for every single enzyme, but the optimum growth uh, for these bacterium is anywhere between zero degrees Celsius and 20 degrees Celsius. So that's how those work. And then next on our list here are the mesophiles. Um, kind of going back to uh, I guess when we're talking about embryonic tissue layers, that may be something that you're familiar with. The uh, mesoderm uh, means middle. And then, of course, anything that is a file, it is a lover. So these are things that love the middle temperatures. And what are those middle temperatures? Well, it's anywhere between 20 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius. And, and this is where you get most of the... Um, pathogenic bacteria in the context of humans pathogenic bacteria because the you know human body human body is at or around I should probably make those approximate signs there 37 degrees Celsius so that's where most of those come from okay and I'll do this next one in red kind of running out of space here we have the thermophiles so in, in this context therm like thermos or um, um, thermometer or whatever this is the context of heat so these are the heat uh, loving bacteria and these uh, as their name generally implies prefer very very uh, warm environments so this is anywhere between uh, 40 to 80 degrees Celsius, depending on, these are all kind of subjective terms, to be honest with you. It depends on who you ask, but these are just really broad, uh, you know, consensus type of, uh, estimates in terms of temperature. And then one last thing that we could add is, is anything that is a extreme to either one of these. So there could be an extreme thermophile, and there could also be an extreme cyclophile. Um, obviously, it's very difficult uh, to get anything below zero degrees Celsius, um, but believe it or not, in, in certain astrobiology and other kind of out there type things where we've seen bacteria at very weird places out there. So really, when I talk about extreme thermophiles, that's really mostly what we're talking about. Uh, there are some, though, extreme psychophiles out there, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Okay, so pH. Uh, I guess another way that we could classify p things of pH are the, I'll start over here, um, alkalotic bacteria, or in, in this context we're talking about anything that is an alkalotic is something that has a pH on the you know pH scale of 7 to 14. So if there's a bacterium that prefers an alkalotic environment, we could say that it loves an alkalotic environment, we call it a alkalophile these are bacteria that have optimum growth at that temperature and then uh, we'll do that for there and then but let's just what is the exact opposite of if I could change colors here the exact opposite of a base uh, uh, well that'd be an acid acids and what do acids well acids have a pH of about anywhere from uh, one to six degree, uh, well, degrees, one to six as their pH range. Um, but generally speaking, you're not going to see a whole lot of bacteria that can ex survive in these. Those would be considered extreme acidophiles if they could live at a pH of like zero. Um, so generally, it's it's a, approximately uh, three to six. But just keep in mind that there are the extreme ends of all these. So something is a bacteria that likes acids. We call it a acidophile. Okay acid, and then file loving. Uh, now in the middle here, for the, those who have a generally a normal pH range of about 6 to 7, we call these 
neutrophiles because, well, it's a neutral pH range. And, and again, these are the ones that you're going to usually find that are infectious or pathogenic to humans, to you. Uh, they generally tend to prefer this range. This is the, uh, you know, the pH of human blood is 7.35 to 7.45, depending on who you're asking. Acids, you may find some of these in the in your uh, stomach. H. pylori would be an example of that, or in maybe uh, certain parts of the intestine. And then you actually may even find some uh, alkalophiles in certain parts of the intestine as well. So that's pH. Uh, moving on to oxygen. So. Um, this is actually something that was kind of confusing for me, uh, I, I think at first, uh, but once you really kind of start to think about it, it, it does kind of come into you. So obviously there's two types of oxygen requirements. There's the aerobic bacterium, those who need oxygen, and I'll just, you know, uh, they need oxygen. Without it, they'll be kind of in trouble. And then there's the, I'll just do it in green because there's not really a color for that, but the anaerobic bacteria. And those that if they're exposed to oxygen, it's ten, generally tends to not be the best thing, best situation for them. And then lastly, and I'll see if I can I'll do this and just go ahead and put it in the white. There's the aero tolerant bacteria. Now, uh, I guess what, what these bacteria are is, is they, if they're exposed to oxygen, they will live. So it doesn't kill them, but at the same time, it's oxygen, O2, is inert to them. Inert. They can't use oxygen for anything, so they can't use oxygen for any uh, metabolic processes. So, I mean, if it's there, it's, it's not going to really do anything to them in terms of uh, metabolism. So now let's just kind of talk about the, break these two categories down. So the aerobic uh, bacterium, there are two kinds that we can have. There are the uh, strict and then faculative. Okay, if something is a strict, that's a T there, strict uh, aerobe in this context, so strictly aerobe, it uh, needs oxygen. O2 needs it. Um, so I guess put over here, without O2, this bacteria will die. Okay, and then the faculative aerobic. And this is, this is kind of where the, con uh, I guess, context does get a little bit confusing because was, I was looking over it through my notes and it just kind of confused me as well. So faculative aerobe, okay, prefers no O2. That's its preference. That is the optimum growth conditions for it. I know it's, it's confusing because we're talking about aerobe, which just prefers no O2. You know, I think I'll, I'll do it in... Uh, uh, I'll do it in white to indicate that it's kind of a, a neutral thing. It prefers no O2. Uh, I'll switch back to blue. But can use if needed. If needed. Okay? So that's a faculative aerobe. Okay? Which is kind of, I guess, a, a misnomer in the means of how we, we categorize these. Do not let this throw you off, but I just did that for simplicity sake. So uh, there's an anaerobic bacterium, okay? And then by the same notion, there is faculative anaerobic bacterium, which is, is totally, um, totally, uh, I guess, kind of counterintuitive by the, the notion here of, of the two, uh, I guess, oxygen signs that we had given to it. But anyways, a faculative anaerobe, okay, are organisms prefer oxygen, but 
can go without it. So this is a little different, I think, in terms of context. Um, their best, their optimum growth, you know, is in, in the presence of oxygen. And of course, there are the strict anaerobes. And these are the ones that, well, I mean, I'll just, I'll draw it up here. They, they can't have any O2. And I guess an example of this would be, uh, um, oh, uh, botulism. The bacterium that causes botulism, uh, you know, whenever they say, you know, for, I guess, as a general stage of wound care, they say open up your 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 wounds every now and then for to let it uh, breathe, quote-unquote. Well, what they're actually doing is you're letting oxygen come in and uh, oxidize any of those bacteria that are in there. Uh, to some extent, it is beneficial. So that's all of that. There is one last thing that I do want to talk about, and they are called micro... Okay, so little amounts, aero oxygen, files. And what these are, these are bacteria that have an optimum growth, uh, growth, <laughs> growth at a relatively a low oxygen concentration and a, uh, in, in context of atmospheric concentrations, uh, a little bit of a high, or I guess high is kind of a, uh, putting words in someone else's mouth, we'll just say a raised uh, CO2 concentration there. So that's something that we uh, have to consider there. All right, so uh, osmolarity or osmolality, as you know, the bacterial cell walls play a role in keeping things kind of in check uh, for most bacteria, but you know, obviously too much uh, of an environment can, too much osmotic pressure can lyse the cell, and there are some that to where sodium chloride can even denature proteins. But the ones who can survive in a highly salt environment are called the halophiles. So I guess in this context, hallow meaning, um, I guess, salty or uh, saturated solutions here. I don't really know the exact Greek meaning behind this, but files in this case means loving. But again, for most bacteria, this is not the, the case. The only time where you'll really see this happening in nature is in like the, uh, the Red Sea or uh, certain uh, salt lakes and things like that. Okay, so one last thing that is a requirement for bacterial growth is the things that they need to create life, and hopefully this will be a review for you. So anything that is a sugar has this molecular formula, CH2O, okay? So let's just take, for example, glucose. This is C6H12O6. Um, it is glucose. It ends in an O, so we know that it is a sugar. By the same notion, um, fructose is a sugar. So there you go. Uh, fats, um, all bacteria need fats and things that we need to make up our membranes and other various things. And these are all, generally speaking, just uh, hydrocarbon structures here. This all should be a review. Um, uh, switch to red. Proteins, we all need proteins, which are in this case made up of certain amino acids. There is uh, 20 different kinds of them, and they always have their unique little structures and things like that. I could talk to you about proteins for a whole video. And then lastly, uh, nucleic acids, which in, you know, they need to make uh, their RNA and their DNA. So, cool.